Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to be chairing a panel of esteemed guests at the Horisus India 2021 meeting. We are here to discuss an important issue which has gained more prominence and urgency in these pandemic times, the India's new education policy. If India is to contribute handsomely to the world economy, the need for upscaling is now even more imperative. NEP 2020 assured that education becomes more interdisciplinary and multilingual and gave broad guidelines on how the states and institutions should implement the NEP 2020. The NEP 2020 offered a more liberal education and vocational training to address the future technological, social and leadership issues at a global level. It was rooted in the ethos of the country and was mindful of the fact that India will have the world's largest workforce by 2027. Similar to the concept of Bhumidra or son of the soil, this education policy has taken birth from the soil itself. It is no longer a derivative of any educational system, but truly designed to represent the 5,000 years of educational strengths of India and represent its rich cultural diversity. NEP clearly has a stamp and vision and mission and eye for detail of the Honorable Prime Minister Narendra Modi. In 2008, when we set up the Global Indian Mahatma Gandhi Eklava School for tribal students in Gujarat, we experienced that education was very close to Mr. Modi's heart. And when we suggested that these tribal students actually learn agriculture farming while learning vocational skills at a school, he immediately sanctioned a 10 acre plot next to the school for farming. So we have personally experienced his passion in education and in educating the poorest of poor people living in rural areas, and especially those from the underprivileged and remote corners of the world. Some giant steps mentioned in the NEP include the replacement of the 10 plus two structure of education with a five plus three plus three plus four model. And at this stage, the NEP also suggests introduction of multiple choices of subjects. An important suggestion was related to the exams, a topic which is close to all the parents' hearts, as well as Prime Minister Modi. The NEP suggests that the students appear for only three exams in grade two, five, and eight, and there won't be any final exams for the remaining seven out of 10 grades. In 2014, we made a representation to the PMO that educational quality frameworks like Malcolm Baldrige and standards should be introduced for all educational institutions. We had mentioned that there were no mechanisms to assess the learning outcomes. Glad to see standards are now part of NEP and will be managed by an assessment body. And a new standard will be established for this by PARAC, the body for performance assessment, review and analysis of knowledge for holistic development in higher education as well. The General Education Council will be framing graduate attributes, or namely the learning outcomes, which are expected to be delivered. It is also be responsible in framing a national higher education qualification framework, taking in the best from Baldrige, Deming, and other quality education frameworks. Other suggestions that we have given were to separate the regulatory functions from that of managing operations and have clear and distinct KPIs for the MHRD functions. We are glad to see that the Higher Education Council of India will be set up to regulate the higher education. Some of the main ideas under NEP are formation of the new education institutes and bodies using fantastic new concepts that will be advantageous to the student community, parent community, as well as other marginalized and underprivileged sections of the society. While a brilliant concept of an academic bank of credit will bring the concept of credits into mainstream education. A National Research Foundation is also aimed at improving research and innovation to foster Indian talent and educators to create some of the best products and services for the world. The National Education Technology Framework or the forum, which will facilitate a change of ideas on technology usage to improve the learning outcomes in students. And the policy proposes new language institutions, such as the Indian Institute of Translation and Interpretation and the National Institutes of Pali, Persian, and Prakrit, 
which is aimed at gathering knowledge from different parts of the world and adding to our existing knowledge base to enhance the education for all. All of these are very important futuristic steps to give the nation the right tools to navigate through the challenges of a new world, which will emerge as the world's progress towards a post-COVID society. As a chairman of Global Schools Foundation, NEP has given us hope for a more exciting and a wonderful future for the upcoming generations who are bound to be benefited from these initiatives chalked out for their betterment. The possibilities are infinite. And when these ideas are coupled with a power and innovative streak in India's youth, all we need now is a proper channeling of this power in the right direction to give win to our sales. How are we going to do this? And what do we need to do in order to prepare ourselves before the start of this new journey? This is what we will discuss with my esteemed panel today. I take this great opportunity to welcome our panelist, Ms. Sushma Paul Berlia, President of the APJ Satya and Sovereign Group India. Ms. Mitakshana Kumari, Advisor, State Planning Commission, Government of Chhattisgarh in India. Mr. Paige Emilson, founder of Crop Worldwide, Demoscop, and Kunskap Skolan Education and Civil Life. Ms. Divya Lal, founder and managing director for Flipland Education India. And Mr. Sandeep Panchpande, chairman of the ASM Group of Institute. And last but not least, Karthik Sharma, co founder, Decode AI India. So over to you, Ms. Sushma. Uh, thank you very much, Atulji. I think you have put the picture very well. The most important part, if we look at all these creations that have been put into place as a framework for the new policy, which I believe we all welcome very much because no policy can be perfect. What is important is to look at the comprehensive direction that has been given by the policy and the alignment that will now have to be made in terms of the rules, the regulations, the framework, and the actual execution on the ground. When we look at it from that point of view, in addition to what you said, I would like to highlight two things. And one is that clearly the founding principles of NEP is of recognizing, identifying, and fostering the unique capabilities of each child in all dimensions. And the child's student's holistic development, not only in academic, but in all aspects of who he or she is. This is something at APJ we have been working on now for very, very many years in our schools and our colleges. And while we have been trying to do this, Certainly, this kind of a framework would make a tremendous difference on how we are actually able to actualize this on the ground. Again, if you look at what the aspirations of industry are and also what each student probably needs to have, not just to be well employable or a great entrepreneur uh, and other ways of success in the world, but also to be a uh, good, productive human being who has actualized their full potential in this world. And some of the individual skills always looked for are the subject and domain skills, the know what as well as the know how of it, and therefore the practice, the exposure to the real world situations, behavioral and social skills, collaborative efforts, energy, passion, as well as uh, values, which are an important foundation stone for anything in life and much more uh, important when we look at the kind of uh, people that we wish to develop in the coming years who are beyond just economic earners. And most of all, of course, critical thinking, ability to make connections, imagination, curiosity. Now, it's great that we are having the, you know, recognize the concept of the foundation years where we believe now and scientifically proven 
that that is where the real foundation of a child's academic and other growth and intellectual imagination creativity all of that is actually fostered beyond that if we see it's a, education is an integrated whole and therefore i am delighted that with nep we are able to look at the integration of education in every way so you are not only looking at transdisciplinary education but you are also looking at education which transcends beyond just impartation of discipline compartmentalized knowledge and in this situation a um, lot of work needs to be done in terms of the gap analysis whether it is the private schools where it is the government schools and i believe it's very important for us if we really really want to uh, you know achieve we've talked about 2027 as the objective in this panel's discussion if that's what we want to achieve capacity building of teachers of leaders and curriculum gap teaching learning methodologies which might need a complete transformation not only for achieving what we have uh, put forth before us as the vision and mission of the policy but also of making sure that no child remains deprived of fundamentals of education and pandemic regretfully has brought before us the horrific situation where many students have escaped the net of being able to get even best basic education leave aside the aspirations that we are talking about i did say i would focus on higher education but higher education would be as effective as what we do at the foundation years and the school education and some of the transformational changes atul ji that you highlighted are absolutely critical for higher education to truly reap the benefits and have an enabling platform for students when they would go through this transformed foundation and school years today we are in a situation where i believe students are still as far as higher education especially is concerned still stuck around the no the no what not even the no how perhaps so leave aside many of the other skills and knowledge and uh, achievements as a overall realization of the potential of an individual are concerned my concern is and you know we could talk about all the things that need to be done um, in more detail if there is time later on but my concern is really that the devil is always in the details so as we move towards the implementation of these policies we need to first of all have time bound programs we've already one and a half year down the line when this was announced and implementation should have started secondly we need to make sure there is an immense capacity building program in place at every level both for the school leaders as well as the faculties also we have to make teacher education and education leader education as a fulcrum and the center piece of what happens therefore before any other reform can actually find its place the first critical thing is to attack teacher education and education leaders capacity building because that will truly is something that will give us the ability to move faster and to scale up in the way that we really need to and wish to and it is in this context that we have to look at completely revamping the teaching learning process it's not just about the curriculum but how the curriculum is taught how the curriculum is practiced and how does it actually lead to the learning outcomes which is what we would like to have achieved and in this context i feel it may not be possible for every institution or every school to be able to do this on their own and to that extent a lot of institutions could be designated as uh, you know regional centers perhaps both at the government level private level who could help to handhold or if people wish they could just follow with 
what is being said last of all my hope my wish and what we need to do going ahead if we really want to achieve the benefits of what we are intending to do nep is to stay away from things which are prescriptive but focus on things which will help us to maintain minimum standards give guidelines and enable people to run schools and institutions in a manner that focus on every child's development mm-hmm. at the end of the day educational institutions are not factories they are a place where the future of this country and this world this universe are being made so thank you very much excellent sushma ji very very comprehensively put your capacity building aspects ability to build the teaching competencies i think all very well taken care note of uh, let me now invite uh, one somebody who has been extremely deeply involved in policy making and at the same time has much more on ground experiences being a parent uh, miss mitakshara kumari what do you think thank you thank you atul ji uh, good morning to everyone i want to also thank horaces and uh, frank and this platform i'm very glad that we are here talking about the new education policy 2020 Uh, and what a time for a new education policy to come out in the bang in the middle of of an unprecedented pandemic uh, where the fault line of of our education system has been thrown into such stark view so i think it's it's a, it's a very timely thing and i want to spend half a minute saying you know all of us recognize that we needed uh, as a country we needed a new education policy coming the last one was 1986 revised in 92 uh, so the context of education has of course gone through a huge change uh, and we needed a policy articulation to to match that uh, further i think the science of what we know of science of education science of learning that has also rapidly changed in the last 30 years or so there's so much more knowledge about how we learn how kids learn how cognitive uh, development takes place in young people so with all that i think uh, it was time to have a new education policy and and we've you know come up with this uh, new education policy 2020 so to that extent i i welcome it um again as sushma ji said the biggest strength in my view of this policy the heart of the policy really is is this recognition of the importance of the early years and this has happened in two ways one is the recognition of you know ece early childhood education in the formal system they have for the first time included kids from 3 to 6 years of age earlier we started school at 6 so it started in grade 1 and we went all the way up to 12 now for the first time 3 to 6 year old kids are in the ambit of the formal school system which is a huge thing really uh, it has huge implications of how we need to approach this Uh, and the second is a, a, a uh, an anomaly of our education system which is this focus on foundational learning see in my view it is in something new like why do you go to school from grade 1 to 5 is to learn the basics right um, and then enrich you know a, a deepen the enrichment as you go forward right so it presupposes that the meaning of education in class 1 to 5 is to be able to learn the basic skills and then build on that but for some reason our education system having focused a lot on access over the years trying to get every which is a huge task and i don't undermine that at all uh, because i think in a country as diverse as us as varied with such low percentage of first generation learners when we first sort of undertook this exercise of of, of building our education system it's no mean task to get everyone to school was no mean task so to so i don't undermine that but having spent that much time we came to a conclusion Uh, some realization somewhere about 10 years ago that we are getting kids to school but kids are not learning what they're supposed to learn in schools so we got you know the reports from asar and nas telling us that kids who are in class 5 still a substantial percentage you know something like 40% 35% still cannot do what is a grade level 2 uh, work so and then that distance starts to compound over time so they are never able to catch up so this policy recognizes that creates a framework around that and that is to my mind the the heart of the policy and the most important part of the policy um it is also at this point i want to bring you know it is professor lant pritchett said this very interestingly that in india we somehow chose a selection system instead of an education system where we get everyone to in the class we compete those who are in the top 10% whatever is taught are going to be right people who somehow will will make 
make their way and the rest get left behind uh, and he contrasted it with say indonesia that focused on a much more uh, focused sort of basic education program but they are also stuck in a rut of a, of a concept where they're not reaching the peaks that they want to so we have the peaks but we don't have a base level they don't have the peaks somehow but they have a higher base level so i i want to you know uh, have a little caveat here that in a, when while we are trying to focus on foundational learning and and you know learning the basics we shouldn't throw away this uh, you know the baby with the bath water as they say and we should continue to ensure that it's not just a mechanistic view of learning outcome and a mechanistic view of learning basic skills it it they have to build on enrichment and enriched curriculum so that it 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 leads to higher order thinking leads to higher order learning so that is one um, having said all that i think the place where i would have liked to see more was really about how we're going to do it as sushma ji said so clearly the devil is in the details the implementation is the key i don't think as policy makers i think even if you read the i actually did this exercise of reading the 68 policy 86 policy as a policy they are beautiful sounding documents they sound really they are in fact the one in a6 it sounds quite relevant even now to me in some parts but somehow we have the the lacunae have emerged in implementation so i need you know i think we need to spend a little time as the system and at the policy level i think we are all trying to do that is to understand where we have not been able to in the past implement for what reasons what are those structural and um, you know other reasons why we have failed in implementation and that's where i think uh, again this was highlighted capacity building at all levels we have institutional architecture you know from ncrts scrts going down to diet crc and talking in the public education system uh, more in the government school education system there is huge capacity built but there isn't uh, they, these are not vibrant institutions these are not cutting edge institutions like they have to be to support an education system of this scale and complexity so we need at every level you know build the strength of teachers and administrators of education um so that is something that that i want more focus on and we need to figure out how we're going to get there uh, the language is there the articulation is there the directional the intent is there in the policy but it is really now uh, the challenge is to see it on the ground uh, translated on the ground the final point i'd like to mention is you know funding again something that we said see, all of this costs money you know for so long we've been yes some of it can happen by redirecting the existing finances we are not optimally spending that is correct but the goal of spending 6% of our gdp on education that remains a goal in policy in 2020 also we are stating it in 68 also we stated it we need to really get down to figuring out how we're going to unlock the funds and here a little bit of my experience in the states states despite the fact that it's it's a current sort of subject and both uh center and state have jurisdiction states end up spending the most on these sectors i think education is financed 70 to 80% by states so how do we strengthen the states capacity for doing this will be a very critical uh, factor it will there will be huge variations some states that are um, you know have the capability have the resources will be able to do it better uh, so this is something that we need to do you know we need to see up front um and figure out how to address again all the issues that are mentioned in the policy whether it is um you know flexible education more flexible education whether it is multidisciplinarity whether it's assessment reform whether it's uh, you know introducing vocational in a more sort of comprehensive way even through the school level all these are great ideas but we have in the past had trouble doing this 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 is not something that was not there this recognition was there but we have had trouble doing it so we really need to spend i would love to spend more time trying to understand why we haven't yet and to really overcome this the pandemic gives us a good opportunity a system that was working in a broken way has has for now for a while you know been at pause when we come out of this and really think about not perfecting the old way of doing things but really to kind of leap from a few stages and and, and get to a point where where you know our education aspirations as a nation as a society as individuals they are met so i think that's what i'm looking forward to over the next uh, 40 minutes or so that we are in session thank you excellent excellent thank you mitak sharad i think that was again very insightful comparing your experiences of the us and the western world and how uh, some of these challenges could still potentially be 
you know, unresolved going forward despite having grand ideas. So let me now bring over to the discussion with Ms. Divya Lal. Uh, Divya, you've been uh, a tech entrepreneur. You've been using technology to, you know, what we see as one of the portes of the National Technological Forum is to really identify technology to see how you can improve learning. So uh, over to you to share your ideas. Thank you, Atulji. And uh, very warm welcome to everybody. Uh, I think um, so much has been said about the policy by both Sushma ji and Taksha ji. And I don't want to get into a repetition phase of telling how uh, welcome change and at least a well broad thought out uh, umbrella it has set up for us. I think uh, let me marry this to the COVID that has happened. And I think it has been unprecedented for India to have no schools open for 12 months, 15 months now. Uh, and if I may say, it has also been a boon for Indian education because it has leapfrogged in ways in terms of edtech adoption that has never been there. It's been unprecedented. I remember March 2020 when Modi ji said no schools shut down. Uh, I think in 24 hours, majority of the educators in India switched on a camera and uh, started taking ownership. And I think that's a big salute to the spirit that the Indian educators uh, showed uh, in terms of their uh, very, very restrictive means of uh, devices, bandwidths, and still ensuring that India will learn no matter what. Now, we are at a very, very interesting phase. And I think one of the piece of discussions I'm having at some other forum is all about we can really go back to the drawing board now and redefine how do we want to run the 210 working days. So, you know, we are having discussions with school owners and saying, as in whenever the schools open, okay, this year, next year, whenever the children come back, we should actually get rid of the eight period curriculum and actually enable 70% of the time for physical activities and for projects and assignments. Why is it? Because that's the part of the skill that will essentially enable a larger part of success in real life. The collaboration skills, the communication skills that can all get honed up with project work, associations, give children opportunity. And as far as the teaching and the learning part is concerned, you can still do it on a couple of days at home via online that you've been doing for maybe one, two years during the pandemic. So when the children are together inside the school with the educator, let's leverage the power more in a project way and give them ample time on physical education on all other activities. This could be a real game changer because if we keep doing what we have been doing for hundreds of years, you know, we can all say and, and the debates are unending on, you know, what does it mean to be taught in a mother tongue in India? It's a political issue now. Who, what is your mother tongue if you are in a particular state? If you get transferred, how will your child learn Kashmiri if you are a chameleon? Then the, I mean, it's like ridiculous and nobody is going to do anything about it. Okay. Secondly, like people are saying multidisciplinarian. I'm sure Sushma ma'am will agree. You get 20 schools in an area and say that, can you imagine to hire 25 different educators for 11, 12, just because children want to study any random subject? It's not possible. You are looking at collaboration. You are looking at, and EdTech will play a very, very big role. Because when I spoke about in some of the cities, they said we would have to use a platform, maybe just have four or five teachers that can beam into all the kids if they want to do yoga with mechanical engineering along with one more subject of music and let's say English for their maths for their 11th and 12th. So what we have to understand is that we are at a very, very unique opportunity. We can play this very smartly on how future generations will see us. That we really got a time where we could have reset it the way we wanted. But if we just go back into the same way of just going back, I don't think so it's going to lend us more. Policies come, policies, I think I liked what Nitaksha said, the 86 policy is not badly written. There's nothing wrong with that policy. I think it's all about how people perceive. And sometimes doing tougher things in volatile situations can really pave the way for a very different way the India of tomorrow will. Okay. And that is how I feel. Uh, it's a, 
it's been at tech platforms that have helped the whole country to learn. People have reached out. I had flipped learn working with 400,000 kids every day across 400 schools. Uh, learning, we are rolling out new options because we're learning from educators. You know, I want this. I don't want this. I want these features, etc. So I think we're all evolving. Needless to mention, I think never in India at tech has been this accepted and even this recognized for its contribution of actually enabling it. So it's going to play a wrong load, but I believe this could be a real game changer moment for India if it's played in a different way. Thank you. Thank you, Devya. I think it definitely uh, we all agree that technology has a super important role to play in getting all our act together. And uh, certainly we look forward to more conversations on this. Uh, may, I, may I now invite Mr. Sandeep Panch Pandey, uh, who, who also has some very interesting journey and milestones to share about from his experiences, you know. So over to you, Sandeep. Uh, thank you so much, Atul, and greetings to everyone. Uh, I see, you know, I say that the educationists are in a very difficult position because the role of education is to prepare our children for the jobs and the careers of the future. And with the technology and science uh, advancing so quickly, that is itself changing. So while we are yet struggling to keep up with the industry, the industry itself is evolving and changing. So, you know, we are in a very difficult uh, situation as such there because we, even the industry doesn't know how the future is going to be. It is predicted that 60% of the jobs which our students are going to do uh, in the very near future don't even exist today. So if we have to prepare our students, we have to teach them the 21st century skills like creativity, critical thinking, problem solving, uh, creativity, uh, as well as, you know, uh, they've also mentioned, you know, collaboration, teamwork. However, these skills cannot be taught in a traditional way. And that is where I see the gap. The new education policy, of course, is very good. You know, we have discussed earlier, uh, both the speakers have talked about it, multidisciplinary, multiple choice, multiple exit, multi-language. Uh, it's a very good policy on paper, uh, looks into the education as a whole. In fact, our group ASM is also from PhD to PhD and in fact, going also into executive education. So uh, a very lovely policy. But the problem I see is the implementation. I don't know if the one size fits all policy is going to is going to be applicable for such a vast and a big country like India. And in last one and a half years, we have been uh, attending and arranging so many webinars and workshops where people really have not understood the policy yet. And then implementing it is going to be the biggest, biggest challenge. And how well we implement it, I think will decide the success of it. Now, when we look at the shortages, at the, as the topic today goes, that what should be done in the near future, uh, you know, I think, yes, we have said that coronization of education, as we say, has given us an opportunity to rethink, reboot, and also reimagine our education systems. You know, while most of the ed tech companies in, are focusing yet to bring the physical classroom online, I think what they should be doing is totally reimagining how it could be taught. Yes, we have having a problem with the access with the digital divide so strong in India. So we have to move from e-learning to M learning as such. But uh, I'm sure that, you know, um, we have got two tech companies here, Divya and Karthik. I think they are going to play a very key role uh, in, in this particular part. The other issue, I would say the biggest issue is shortage of good faculty. Now, when I say shortage of faculty, it doesn't mean only qualified faculty but quality faculty. Now, when you look at quality faculty, you will see the gap is very, very high. We need our faculty to be upskilled, reskilled, and also new skilled. So not just the faculty, we need the educators, the policy makers, all of them to go through this particular process as such. Another part I feel what should change and which is a problem to our sector is our assessment methodology. Uh, we are just testing students on memory and road skills. That has to change. And probably if we get new ways of assessment, we might be able to move away from that. Uh, I, had, I had discussed with you, I have a 14 year old who has started a company who is trying to bring in these skills. And what he says is that 
the new age skills cannot be taught in the traditional system otherwise it will end up uh, say creativity will end up being just an academic subject where students define creativity but never implement it uh, so uh, yes that is the biggest challenge what we face another area which um, you know the private education sectors are facing is the cash flows and this has always been a problem access to easy education loans should be provided in the country yes there are some things on paper where this collateral is not required but practically speaking there is a big issue there so you know something uh, if you can work up on that that is going to give a big impetus to the uh, education side the another area talking on higher education is employability most of the students here would join an mba or a post graduate course to find good employment and i think so that is where the industry institute uh, should come together and work on to that uh, you know at asm we've got a very unique methodology called as edge excellence driven guaranteed employability program where we are providing inputs from the top education institutions like the harvard and the iims and adding it with it with certifications and uh, doing customized programs with the industry you know we have been working with ibm with aws we have launched india's first uh, uh, emerging technology program so so working with the industry and the institutes itself see one of the areas where i see lacking is you know sushma ji has such a good institution she is collaborating with international universities i am collaborating with international universities but we both are not collaborating <laughs> i think that that is the missing link we educationists should come together and have very good industry institute collaboration so what is required is a change in the mindset for parents for teachers for educators uh, we are obviously going to move into hybrid learning and blended learning and since the we have got the technology people here see the earlier model was high touch and low tech now with coronization we are forced to have the high tech and low touch but we will see the actual impact if we can move to the high touch and the high tech model so i i think that is an absolute key where we can go ahead and yes as shushma said i do believe that holistic education is important so we have to teach the soft skills the hard skills the business skills and tech skills and only if all those skills are taught will we be able to create uh, students who can contribute At, to all levels of the society as well as uh, meet the global challenges so uh, i have tried to cover a lot of things uh, over to you atul back thank you thank you sandeep uh, again uh, you have very clearly articulated the challenges we have with the nep uh, last but not the least let me invite karthik karthik you and artificial intelligence is something that your your thinking and thoughts would be very essential towards how any peak be you know made a success so may i request you to come and share your thoughts in relation to any peak and how ai could make a big big picture role there thank you atul ji and and thanks for um, having me and i completely resonate uh, what sandeep was talking about wherein um, he uh, among all of you i am sort of an outsider because i come from a tech and industry perspective and the way i see the role of education apart from making somebody a good citizen i think the broader uh, vision is that we should make a learner or a student relevant in the society now that relevance may have multiple connotations and one of them is uh, you know employability which sandeep mentioned that if i you know learn something in school then i graduate i should be a active contributor in the society and and be it through economic engine or be it through in general value addition now that being said um, i think as as mitakshar ji was also talking about that policies have been there for last 20 odd years and i think nep just sort of uh, you know brushes it up in, in the new light and new context but i think the impetus is to make sure that how do we interpret it and these are broad guidelines nobody needs to follow them point by point and um, you know i see for example cbsc as one of the bodies has taken a few from nep and they have de- started developing their own uh, you know guidelines among it right so like they launched ai as a subject and and that's what my focus area is data science and coding has been launched by cbsc so they have just taken the broad construct of the policy and now they are coming up with their own recommendation and i think that's what states and center need to do and just uh, do not follow it point by point but take a broad recommendation now in terms of how technology or ai can help 
I also resonate what uh, you know there were Jeeva was talking about, wherein we have completely reimagined the way learning is happening. If you see, um, you know, from industry perspective, students who are right now in school, by the time they graduate, it's next seven to eight years. The way the industry is operating is completely different, right? Like when I graduated from IIT ten fifteen years back, we used to have this concept of front end development, back end development, database. Now everything is full stack developer, right? All companies are looking for full stack dev. So if you today graduate and say, "Hey, I have a degree and I can only do front end," nobody is going to hire you. And the other uh, modus operandi is that the way the jobs are happening, nobody is hiring anybody for a specific skill or nine to five. People are looking for gig workers. So this, you know, is is a bit overwhelming for a lot of teachers, educators, and parents because we have been groomed to silo somebody that okay, you are a lawyer, you are a doctor, you are an engineer. But now you're looking at people who've got multiple skills, who can do a little bit of tech also, can do business development also. That's the kind of opportunities you know that are coming to the fore. So how do we prepare our learners to remain relevant in this sort of environment where they can work from anywhere, uh, they can work anytime, they can work on a specific project, and they may not have a fixed income stream later on. So this is a reimagining of workplace which has already happened. But similar reimagination of uh, education, even after this policy, has not really happened. We're trying to force fit this policy in the older construct, which to me is a bit disturbing. But you guys are more uh, qualified to to interpret it that how this may happen. But from an industry perspective, we are looking for people who can who can support this sort of a workplace environment. The other uh, important point for me is, and I think somebody also covered it, is the whole point of digital discrimination. while we have best of these uh, you know zoom platforms and technology for e learning devas companies uh, you know does edtech as well now if you do not have a good connection and if you do not have a good device you know you you have to face the digital discrimination and we cannot have inclusiveness you know we run a ai education program for uh, one of the ngos which dr kiran bedi runs now jyoti india foundation you got the best students there they have picked up ai with no background of maths and science but you know the hard breaking part for me is to see them sitting on side of the road taking their dad's phone for 5 minutes and just trying to learn and they say oh but my dad has to go to work now now i cannot uh, learn it's extremely hard breaking but how do we solve that problem you've got such a talented uh, learner base but they just do not have access to the right infrastructure and they could be doing much better than people who study in fancy schools so i think that's something which also from an industry perspective uh, you know i would sort of you know try to get some answers from from the educators here maybe offline that how we can solve that problem collaborate uh, you know with industry partners with government and try to solve this issue lastly um, i think some of these technology enhancements like ai for example in which i work with it can also leapfrog we don't any more need to work linearly in terms of uh, progress right you know we talked about how how do we teach at scale now we all seen um, i had the opportunity to work with a humanoid called sophia in in uk a couple of years back and it was limited use case for customer support to begin with but now they are also exploring use case in education so if you got humanoids like that which are uh, you know natural language processing enabled who can have at scale interaction with the students which is not robotic but it's more empathetic they understand the sentiment they can um, express emotions and that sort of a uh, you know high tech high touch which sandeep was talking about if we can enable that through technology and ai can help you do that and i think that's a interesting use case to see how we can make education more inclusive and accessible to everyone at scale so i think that's how some of these technologies can help and lastly i think all of this could not work and will not work if we do not have the right uh, teachers uh, you know set available who are trained and who are ready to invest in their continuous professional development i see so many teachers who have done well but now that um, you know that motivation to continuously upgrade themselves is something which somehow gets missing maybe it's due to the the peer pressure maybe it's due to the way uh, the construct is set up for them but i think if we are able to to do that then i think uh, we will be able to solve the the bigger puzzle so i think teacher training is extremely critical and how to motivate them for their personal uh, continuous professional development i think we're out of time thanks thanks atul thank you thank you thank you uh, 
Karthik for taking that up. So we we do have uh, very few seconds or maybe a few minutes left. So maybe let me throw for the first question. Uh, given the West is known to be the so-called uh, you know excellence centers in high learning, they have done their been there you know and they've shown that how they have been able to you know correlate with the industries and uh, really become centers of excellence. And you have many many legacy cases there. Unfortunately, India has no specific ones you know barring uh, very few institutions. So the question to you, Sushmaji, is. Do you see any role of foreign universities coming into India and helping us to sort of, you know, help us with the NEP 2020 vision? Uh, Atulji, uh, the basic issue is that we need to recognize that foreign universities, and I'm really talking of the very good ones, because those are the ones that we are looking for for this kind of leadership. Um, have a lot to do and are themselves have been struggling, in fact, a great deal during the pandemic to reinvent themselves apart from facing financial and other difficulties. So I think if you're looking for them to come into India to either set up campuses or to, uh, you know, uh, actually do things on the ground or invest into India, I don't think that's going to happen at all. But I believe that if institutions and the government will take a lead and reach out to them and on a model where we are not expecting them to do the financial investment, there is a lot of scope for getting some insight into what to do and how can we reinvent many of the things, although we need to recognize the fact that they themselves are perhaps going through a reinvention at their end. Uh, having said that, I can give one example, like we, our APJ Satya University that we had set up here was actually my younger son, Aditya, was at Harvard at that time. And he was very influenced with one of the four fellows of Harvard University, Professor Rosowski. And if we look at the entire academic system, the credit module approach, the, a lot of things, choice-based credits, ability to exit and so forth, all of them we were able to enshrine in our system even before NEP. Some things we were able to do, some we were not. But if I were to flag two key issues that I believe have been great challenges to us, one has been the, you know, you know just educating the educational leaders and the faculty and transforming the way that they think and also to bring in the industry, connect in a meaningful way and not the lip service that we sometimes pay so that there is a teaching learning happening by industry within the university, centers of excellence can grow up and we are also able to cater to their needs in other ways. The other challenge, of course, we hope NEP will be able to address because of the ability to roll out liberal art and transformational um, and transdisciplinary education uh, was certainly truncated at that time. I would just like to mention very quickly, if I may, that, you know, when we are talking about liberal arts education, we are not talking about liberal arts subjects. We are really talking about fostering the kind of thinking, critical thinking, collaborative problems, real life problem solving skills, which are the need of the hour. And what every student, apart from the depth and the standards of whatever discipline they are pursuing, they needed to have had been imbued with different domains of learning. And therefore, that means a whole academic construct. Anyway, my real purpose was only to say that a lot we, people have been trying to do. lot could be done. We can learn tremendously from foreign universities, even if they don't actually come. But at the end of the day, we have to increase our own absorption power. And that can only happen when we transform our people and our systems on board putting. Right. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Sushmaji. Uh, so I think uh, an area that Sadeep has touched upon, just related to that, uh, how do you see alignment of industry skills, you know, where people on one hand, government talks about making India, 
and then you do not have corresponding make in india related skills you have you know, staggered vocational programs etc going on all over the place uh, by several operators but how do you see what should be a sort of a framework or a guideline where we align what our industry has to become and then go back into the high learning institutions define those areas where high learning institutions need to work on and then work backwards to the schools area so how do you see we can you know play a role in creating some sort of framework there to align industry skills uh see atul i i think uh, one of the ways for that is to have participation of the industry along with education uh, and again when i is meant uh, participation i am talking of active participation where we are co creating co developing and co delivering the courses with the industry that is the model what i have started uh, you know adopting at asm from 5 to 6 years i also went to harvard i am alumni there and when i spoke to my faculties there and we have been speaking to the deans the noria and the new dean also but they have always been telling me that some the things in india are different you cannot follow the harvard way in india and get results you have to adapt to the local conditions uh, you know think global act local is the mantra and however i i believe that you know if we can get into that phase like i uh, i talked to you about aws what we have done we we went to aws talked out where is the gap in the industry where the new uh, skills are coming and created a course with reverse competency mapping to meet those requirements so we are we are partnering with the industry to fulfill their own requirements as such so co creating co developing and and co delivering the courses we are even co certifying those courses together so i think that could be a good model follow and something what uh, vocational education in germany is doing like karlsruhe or whatever for vocational education uh, that is something what we need to do but it's going to be a long way for us to reach there yeah i think taking from the same queue on vocational skills and vocational education so karthik how do you see uh you know vocational skills really playing a big role uh in in our future journey i think vocational uh, skills will become more and more relevant because as i was talking about since most of the workplace now is becoming more gig oriented and you need on demand skill uh, workforce there is this beautiful platform which doesn't work in india but works well in us called amazon mechanical turk wherein you just give specific task and there are people who are earning you know thousands of dollars just doing that they don't have a formal degree they don't have a formal education but you can learn specific skills and you can still um, you know do well in life so i think that's going to be the focus but unfortunately in india with my limited experience i have seen that the way vocational skills um, is done is given a more like a step son or step daughter treatment and they don't really um, i think mitakshi you want to say something no no after you after you kartik yeah so i think that needs to be fixed when uh, you know people do not see it as a option that oh if i have not done well in life let me do vocational skill as a backup option so i think that mentality needs to be uh, reformed and for sure through policy recommendation that's possible and i would love to hear mitakshi ji your view how do you see this problem no i i uh, with the permission of atul i'll jump jump in here um so when you mentioned that i you know i was just reminded i think this idea of the gig economy being prepared for that and what do you prepare your kids for whether it's in vocational whether it's in you know this emerging sectors and it all comes down for me to the basics and this is something that we have been struggling with you know with the with the minister of skills i think we had a lot of um, discussion around um, you know there was this national skill development corporation there was a national skill development mission and uh, i back in the day when i was working with this uh, setup called the national knowledge commission we were working collaboratively collaboratively with them to understand what to do i'm talking about 2007 8 and uh, one of the things that the skills people said very emphatically it was the secretary i think labor at that time and he said um, you know you give me kids who you have not taught to know basic counting uh basic alpha then you tell me that he should somehow learn how to do the vocational skill for which he needs certification for which that the idea is really there are people with these skills but we need to certify them we need to be able to make them you know get better money for it we need to recognize their prior learning all those things so his point was and which i you know since then in this vocational space i think that's the key that unless you fix their basic cognitive development that happens early on 
then to say that uh, you know they will succeed in vocational why would you why would they do that why would they succeed so that is the the glitch that we have that we are trying to build layers on top of a foundation that has not been uh, strengthened so i think even in vocational education again we are going through this and and there was a big debate about vocationalization of education are you making vocational education who are the people who are going i think we have a jam okay uh, by the time she comes back uh, in the in the yeah sorry we lost you for a second oh please continue with akshara okay sorry about that uh, so i'm saying so the kids who do get pushed into vocational streams get pushed out per force it's not a choice it becomes because they are not able to access uh, the mainstream education for some reason so this hierarchy is built in so until we change that uh and i don't think it's going to be possible to change it entirely we just have to do it well we have to give them enough um sort of uh, skills and and programmatic support and and structural support so that they can they can uh, but they can you know effect do their employment effectively but it won't happen without the base is my main point like i think the problem of vocational is the problem of education also which is not a separate problem very well said uh last but not the least uh how do you see if we are in the private sector particularly at tech sector that you are in uh, how do you see they playing a role in accelerating the the benefits of the nep of course nep is a framework but end of the day the outcomes that we are looking at the objectives we are looking at how do you see the private sector playing a role in accelerating those objectives so you can provide uh, you can actually intervene as a private player or let me say currently i'm a platform player um, when you collaborate i work in the cable segment so you have to understand from a point of view of a school what are the key implementation challenges you know how do you provide 25 courses as an option in 11 12th okay to a school that makes it realistic and so on so can you get people on a platform can you be in the best teacher across schools etc uh, solve a real issue problem for example multilingual content okay access to that if you have children from various backgrounds coming in teachers struggling what's really the real mother tongue that you are really driving into okay you can provide that uh, i think it is all about understanding where the real pain points are like you know today one of the biggest pain points that i'm working on is transforming the homework delivery because even though uh, homework does not have much of a value point system in the k12 segment but uh, just to give you a sense india generates 1 billion homework notebooks every day and i am now working with schools into transforming that and creating data value and really building a real personalized learning thing so you know you don't have to judge a child with the periodicity of assessment saying you know he got this much across 20 tests i can give you in 210 days 180 days when a homework was generated what kind of a profile it can be and that can be a true transfer of a child moving from one level to another so there are various ways i think so many of us are playing our roles you know we all all the stakeholders have a role to play and i think if we keep our vision clear and one thing i've always said is you can start today you don't need the government to flag off what to start with what not to start with and so on india is a is a is a country of various gradients across economies across levels across challenges and so on but we have to start and start implementing things that come easy and start building on them and there can't be a uniform structure in which we want everybody to go in the same level i think we have to appreciate our diversity and we have to play on that as a strength to build it absolutely so i think very well said uh, this has been one of the most encouraging conversations around uh, education both covering school education as well as high learning uh, i don't want to repeat what all our member panelists have said but i think i would like to just sum up on a last note that you know recently we were having a chat with uh, a university operator who has 16 universities in latin america and uh, the owner founder mentioned to us very interesting point he said look we are spread across multiple parts so obviously we don't have a similar demographic similar student base but what really was the common success factor among their universities was the aspect of adaptive learning 
where they said every child had a curated program based on where they were, how they were learning. And actually that made a big difference in the way, I mean, he looked at it as positively as, oh, we had far lower attrition this year. Uh,